Hello, everybody. My name is Kathleen Backer. I'm the executive director with the Brown County Historical Society. And on behalf of the board of directors, welcome to this second of our Lunch and a Bite of History presentations. OK, <laughs> e even better. I was afraid of it, I guess. That's the first. <laughs> The Brown County Historical Society is a not-for-profit organization and we are a membership organization, so we encourage you to become members if you aren't. It supports programs like the one you're attending today. I'm going to give you an update of some programs coming up and encourage you to participate if you're able. Uh, the next event coming up is next week. It's a tribute to mothers. It'll be held at Turner Hall, it's a luncheon. And the last time we did it, we filled this room. And if you wear an apron, uh, you qualify for a door prize drawing. And over 90% of the people that attended that time wore aprons. So come to that event, wear an apron, have some fun. Men wear aprons too. There's carpenter aprons, et cetera. The butchers wore aprons. So men are invited as well because we know you had mothers also. Then on the 19th, we're having a volunteer open house. Now some of you may say, oh, I'm already a volunteer. I don't need to go. Well, we encourage you to come because we provide you with an update of all of the activities that we have and the services provided by the BCHS and how you can assist with those. And maybe there's some programs that as a volunteer here, you're not aware of and that you would like to participate. So join us on the 19th in this room. We'll have it set up like a trade show and we'll provide coffee, water, and rolls for those of you who want to indulge. The next Lunch and a Bite of History is on the first Thursday in June, and that's Eric Warmka will be presenting about the, the, the history of, of funeral services. So that should be an interesting one. And now Amy Johnson, our Brown County Historical Society Programs and Visitor Services Manager, will introduce our presenter. Enjoy. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Johnson. I am the Programs and Volunteer or Visitor Services Manager here at the Brown County Historical Society. So thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I would like to introduce Megan Schnicker. She is a traditional herbalist and owner of Lakota Made in Mankato, which is currently on the move to a new space on Riverfront Drive after quickly outgrowing its prior space. In addition to being the owner of Lakota Made, she is also the founder and executive director of the Mikado Revitalization Project, MRP. It's a nonprofit organization that is based in Mankato. MRP provides classes and programming related to indigenous cultures, art, history, wellness, and plant medicine. So everybody, thank you. Thank you, Megan, for coming here today. And ladies and gentlemen, Megan Schnicker. Um, good afternoon. I greet every one of you with a warm heart and a handshake. My name is Minnie Warbonnet's woman, or my English name, Megan Schnitger. Um, thank you for coming <laughs> um, on this rainy spring day. Finally, warm enough to call it spring. I was so stoked. Um, I was super distracted on the drive over here because I'm like checking out all the ditches and the plants and I'm like, oh my God, finally it's green. So <laughs> after the 10 months of winter, um, uh, winter, I'm not a fan. I know that we can harvest all year round, but oh my God, winter just kills me, especially when you know you have little ones um, and it's just too cold for the little ones to go outside. So yes, 10 months and then I'm finally I'm like outside, everybody's outside. So um, yesterday we celebrated the first really warm day where the toddlers can go outside without jackets. And um, my brother has started a buffalo tanning, uh, buffalo hide tanning business. 
And so yesterday he was like, okay, kids, I made a trampoline. And they thought that he would, they were going to go outside to a real trampoline. Well, he had strung up a buffalo hide, which would be taller than the, from floor to ceiling right now. And it's all stretched out, and he needed to break the hide. And so he had all my girls um, jumping on the hide, trying to break it. And so they were like, what is this? This is so fun. And, they, and their uncle was like, it's a, it's a buffalo hide. And they all stop. And they're like, what? We're jumping on a buffalo hide? And he's like, yeah, this is all the, this is all the brain matter that you got to break. And they're like, brain matter? So they quickly got off. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, they jumped out. And they're like, OK, let's go, let's go get some food. And so they were, they were all excited. So we dove into the woods. And um, they were all picking out different plants that they wanted to eat. You know, they were jumping in our garden to see what was um, already coming up and stuff like that. So they're excited. Um, as well as I am for the green. And so that's green's my favorite color. Yesterday I looked like a green bean because I had a green joke or jacket on. I had a green um, leggings and I had a um, I think it was a black shirt, but it looked like a green like a green bean when I zipped my coat up. So um, green's one of my favorite colors and summer and warm times is my favorite season, not just because I have arthritis and this in the winter hurts, but because um, we get to be outside. And not only do we get to do fun stuff outside, but we also get to teach my kids all about what grow, what's growing around us. And so every season, I make it a goal to teach my kids, you know, my older girls who are 9 and 10 right now, um, you know, my 9-year-old can identify, I think it's like 20, she was bragging yesterday, so I should remember. Um, she was, I think she was like up to 25 plants that she can identify and harvest. And my 10-year-old, um, who's more into Roblox than she is outside. And so she got her computer back yesterday from being grounded from it for a month for attitude. But um, <laughs> so she wasn't, too out, she wasn't too keen to go outside and, and do plants with us. But um, uh, so you know, it's, it's a goal of mine to teach because um, you know, not just my kids, but the general public, because there's a lot of people that just don't know what grows outside. And it's just a green blur. Um, and when I started uh, learning about plants, I was for around four or five years old. And um, because I grew up, you know, my parents both worked and went to school full time. And so I was over at my grandma's house um, with my uncle and my cousins um, growing up. And they had a large, large farm. And so if we didn't want to, you know, go hang laundry because my grandma had one of those old um, washing machines where it was the big tub and then you had this these two rollers right here and so you had to wash them in there and then thing them there or ring them through there and then go put them on the line that was the way my I grew up doing laundry my kids have no idea how privileged they are um, <laughs> and so if I didn't want to do laundry and help my grandma in the house you know we had to be as soon as the sun was up we had to grab something quick to eat and go outside otherwise she was going to put us to work and so we would go chase horses and cows and um, play outside and jump off the hay bales and try not to break something. Um, and so my uncle would, um, you know, every once in a while we'd stop and get hurt or stung or, you know, put a cactus through our hand. Um, I have a couple permanent um, scars on my hands because I jumped off a hay bale. And when I landed um, there, I landed into a, um, a cactus patch and I had put cactus through my hands. And so I was pretty little, so it, like I don't remember it. But my uncle remembers it because I had these big cactuses sticking out of my hands. Um, he's like, "Well, if you go up, if you go up to the house and you talk to your grandpa, he's going to tell you that you're going to go get a tetanus shot with a needle like this big, and then he's going to be mad because he had to drive you two hours to the hospital." And I was like, "Okay, okay, I'm not going up there." So how do I fix my hands? Well, he pulled them out with his rusty pliers. And then um, <laughs> uh, we were feral farm kids. Um, shoes weren't a thing. Um, and so he pulled the cactus out with his rusty pliers. I remember that. And then he's like, oh, I probably should have used the new pair of pliers. And he's like, oh, we are right. And then he uh, grabbed this plant out of the ground, and he like balled it up. And he went like this. And then he stuck it in my hands. And he's like, you'll be OK. And I'm like, Uncle, what was that? And, he, and I was like, what would you do? And because um, you know it took this, it stopped the bleeding, and then you know after a while of playing, it didn't hurt, and then they were you know they healed up just fine. And I have weird little dimples right here from the bigger pokey parts of the 
of the cactus that went through my hands. But, and I remember that was my first lesson in, in plants from my uncle. And um, from there, he started teaching us about, um, then I got stung by a bee. And so he did it again. He just grabbed something green off the ground and he wadded it up and put it on my bee sting. And then I didn't swell and then I didn't swell up and my hand stopped hurting. And I was like, what the heck? So I started following my uncle all around, even though he's busy, super, super busy taking care of the farm and being the main farm worker, taking care of horses and all that other stuff. I started following him around. And then pretty soon he started pointing things out to me. And I was like around four or five years old. And um, my current five-year-old, um, has the same kind of brain. She's like, what is this? And what does it do? And now I'm going to pick it. Um, and so I followed him around. He started teaching me about all the plants um, that his great grandma taught him. And then my grandma was like, oh, she's interested in plants. So now she can come garden with me. And so I went and, <laughs> and so I got to pick all the, all the weeds. And while she, while I was like grumbling about it, she was like, well, those aren't weeds. We still use those ones too. And so she was like, "Don't throw them in the, don't throw them in compost. I want you to put them over here, and we're gonna, we're gonna make something with them later." And I'm like, "Okay." So I started sorting out all these weeds, and then we were hauling up to the house, and we were making soups and stews with them and breads. Um, we were drying them out and putting them in jars, and I had no idea what was going on. And uh, now that I'm 39. <laughs> I have to think for a minute. <laughs> I had a birthday um, last month, I think. Um, and uh, <laughs> I don't pay attention. The kids' birthdays, I remember those. I don't remember my own. And um, I uh, start, you know, now that I'm 30, 30 pretty sure I'm 39. Um, 83, 22, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so now that I'm looking back and I, you know, I'm watching how my kids are raised so much differently than what I, where I grew up because um, we were outside from sun up to sundown. It didn't matter what the temperature was. Um, you know, I, I, I feel bad for my kids because they, they don't have my grandma anymore. Um, she passed away a long time ago, or right, right after I graduated high school. And so um, they were born well after that. And so they don't have her to teach her all that stuff. They still have my uncle, but then um, they also have me because they taught me all of this stuff. And then uh, my great-grandma, on my dad's side, I met her, um, Eva Bulbear, I met her when I was around eight years old. And um, I met her and I had no idea how old she was. I just knew she was really old when I first met her. Um, and when I first met her, my dad was like, oh, here's your grandma, and then stuck me in a room with her and I was like, I don't know who this woman is. And um, she was, there was a huge language barrier because her first language was Lakota and my first language was English. And I didn't grow up listening or hearing the language every day until I met her and my grandpa Adolf and my, uh, my other grandpa and all of their, you know, my grandpa Adolf's siblings, my dad's aunts and uncles. I didn't, I didn't know them and I didn't hear the language until I met them. And um, so I started picking, picking out words that my grandma was saying that I thought I knew what they were. And she kept coughing, and it was, I remember it was hot, and she had an air conditioner in her room. And um, she, uh, she kept saying her, you know, she kept coughing, and she kept doing this. And then after a while, I was like, oh, your chest hurts. Okay, so what do I do? And, you know, she was like, kept pointing outside, and I'm like, okay. And then my Aunt Marva came in, and she was uh, talking to my grandma. And I was just like listening to this language and I was just like, wow, I wish I knew what they were saying. And then my grandma Marva was like, here, I got to take you outside. She wants you to pick her, uh, go pick her medicine. And I was like, okay. And um, I had some knowledge at that point of plants, you know, being eight years old. And so she took me outside and she was like, oh, I don't remember which one it is. And I was like, what are you looking for? And she's like, I'm looking for the one for cough. And I was like, oh, it's this one. This one's over here. And she was like, how'd you know that? And I said, my uncle Neil, my mom's brother. And so she was like, oh, okay. So she went and we picked mullen. And um, so we picked some mullen out of the backyard and we took it inside. And you know, I was always told that you don't, you don't use, first you don't use that for toilet paper. Um, <laughs> uh, that was my uncle's first teaching about mullen is you don't use it for toilet paper, even though it looks soft. 
Uh, and I couldn't quite understand why, but after picking it with him for a while, I understood because then it starts to get itchy. And I was like, that's why you don't use it for toilet paper. <laughs> Even though some people I have heard in South Dakota call it cowboy's toilet paper. And I was like, why would you do that? Um, but anyway, so I, I picked that some of that with her. And uh, I knew my, uh, my uncle Neil used it for his cough. And he made it into a tea. And when I went inside, my grandma, she said, here, you need, to, you need to make it small. And then you need to put it in the oven for just a little bit to dry it out. And I was like, OK. And so I was paying attention, and I was watching her. And so we dried it out, and so it was crispy when we brought it out of the oven. And then we took it back to my great-grandma. And she crumpled it up, and she put it into um, this little leather bag that she had. And it had a bunch of other herbs in it. And she, I didn't know what they were, but she mixed uh, that mullein in there. And then she put it, uh, put it in her, her tobacco pipe, and she smoked it. And then all of a sudden, she quit coughing. And I was like, whoa, you can do that with that? And so, and then she started and then she started talking to me, and she started showing me her little bag of herbs, and I could smell the difference in the different herbs, and I can see the difference in the herbs, but I didn't know what all of them were. And then every couple weeks, my dad took me up there, and I started learning, and I started picking up Lakota words and the meanings and how we used to use them, and my, I started understanding my grandma Eva, and uh, she started telling me how her great grandma, how she learned how to harvest these herbs, how to use these different herbs. And it was completely different from what my uncle Neil told me. And so she had the cultural knowledge um, that she had kept through the many generations. And my uncle Neil um, is, the, is, a, is a product of, of boarding schools. And so um, because my mom's parents, um, my Grandpa, or my grandpa Orville, my mom's dad, came over on a boat when he was two years old. So I'm a little bit Norwegian, um, <laughs> just a little bit. And uh, <laughs> that's where my green eyes come from. Um, I have four siblings. I'm the oldest. I have three younger brothers, uh, me and Mitch, who are the oldest two. Um, we both have green eyes, green or blue eyes, depends upon the day. And then my younger two brothers look exactly like my dad. They got super dark hair. Um, dark, dark brown eyes, they almost look black. And so we say like half of us are my moms and half of us are my dads. Um, <laughs> so, um, but my, my mom's mom, she went through boarding school and so she was scared to speak the language. She was scared to do any of those teachings. And she, you know, never kept, never kept anything and never passed anything down. So I was extremely fortunate that my dad's side of the family did. And so that whole, from eight to about 16-ish, uh, when my great-grandma Eva passed away, is where I absorbed as much cultural history and knowledge as I could. Um, even though like, I can't speak Lakota fluently, I can understand it. And my grandma would speak it to me. I'd pick out words here and there, and I'd get the gist of what she was saying. And so she taught me, um, she taught me about, uh, t taught me and t uh, showed me how uh, to, harvest different plants and a lot of the plants that she talked about um, are actually pretty common and they grow everywhere in the Midwest and so mullen was her favorite because it was you know she had a bad cough and she was like 100 and, 110 when she passed away and so um, she was pretty old <laughs> she was pretty old and uh, I remember the the last time that I saw her um, she said something along the lines of um, don't be sad um, I'm, I'm really old and I'm, and I'm ready. And I'm like, okay, where are you going? <laughs> um, and then I found out that, I found out what she meant. And so I lost my cultural teacher, but at the same time, um, I was a teenager and I was being young and dumb. And so it, it didn't really quite register me, register with me um, the amount of loss that I had. And, but I still had um, her husband, my grandpa Royal, and her son, my grandpa Adolf, um, to teach me the, the men's side of the medicine because in our culture, in Lakota culture, um, we have men's medicine and we have women's medicine. Um, men go out and harvest all their own medicines and women don't ever touch it um, because women have significantly different medicine and they don't use the same, they may use some of the same plants but they may, may use different parts of it. And so uh, my grandpa Royal, my grandpa Royal, he, uh, he showed me 
all the men's part of it. And he was like, your brothers are too young to understand what I'm trying to teach them, but you understand what I'm saying, so I'm going to teach you. And he was like, all these, he, he was talking about my cousins. <laughs> and he was like, all these kids around here, they don't want to listen to me, so I'm going to teach you because you're the only one that follows us old ones around. So I was like, okay, cool. Um, so I absorbed as much as I could from him while he was here, and then he passed on not too long after, she, after my grandma Eva did. And then my grandpa Adolf um, told me that I was his favorite even though I have like 600 some odd cousins on my dad's side of the family. <laughs> and so um, I learned as much as I could from him as well. Um, and then not only are they, are they really old, um, they were really old, um, but uh, I found out that uh, my, the, my dad's side of the family, which is Bull Bear, um, is one of the oldest families um, in how do I explain? In our tribe. Um, so in our tribe, we have what we call, so there's Lakota, which is our dialect. And our, the biggest tribe, or the, the main part of the tribe, is um, Otechi Shakoni. And then that's like the main name of the tribe. And then from there, we go down to the different dialects of the tribe. And then from there, it's like, it's like kind of like federal government, state government, and all that kind of works its way down. And so I found out uh, through my uh, through my grandpa, that Bull Bear is one of the oldest names in Otechi Shakoni and was actually the original Bull Bear, had five sons. And um, when he decided that his tribe was too big, that he sent four sons in four different directions, and that was the beginning of the Otechi Shakoni over 700, 800, 900 years ago, something like that. Um, and uh, from there, we have been, my, there have been uh, men's spiritual leaders and all that other stuff. But at my wedding, my grandpa told me that uh, I was the first firstborn daughter of a bull bear in over 300 years and that I have big responsibilities. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so he said, from, he said, for whatever you, whatever you have learned, whatever we, you have, we have taught you, you need to share. It doesn't matter who you teach that you need to share. And I know that um, a lot of people in my culture do, do what we call gatekeeping. They think they deem it too sacred to share. Well, I'm not one of those people. Um, I like to share. And so, um, like I said, mullen was one of my grandma Eva's very favorite plants. And so um, she taught me about when to harvest it for tea, which is um, early spring. If you want to use it for tea, you get it before the, the flowers start to bloom. And so, um, and she said, if you wanted to use it for smoke, you get it after the flowers bloom. And she says, and if you want to make syrup with the flowers, you have to get it while the flowers are blooming. And so if you know anything about mullen, you know that they have little black bugs. And I'm not a bug person. I don't understand bugs. So the little black bugs that live on mullen, I call them mullen beetles. And that's because that's what my grandma called them. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, Nature knows that that medicine is, is really good too, and so nature is also after that medicine. And so those little bugs wait until, the, until those flowers start to pop, and then they run up there and they eat them, or they take them down. And so um, when you're stocking your mullen stock, um, she said that you have to make sure you have to pay attention to that mullen stock while it's blooming because those flowers don't all open at once, and they'll just open here and there. And so, because that plant knows that it's really good medicine, and so it wants to share. It wants to make sure that all of nature and all of living life gets p part of that medicine too. And so, um, she said, make sure that when, we, when you take those flowers, that you leave some for the others, and that you don't take all the flowers off of one plant. You go get them from all the different plants. And then she said, you gotta make sure you leave some of them so that they can turn into seed. And so she said, after the plant has dried out in the late fall or in the early winter, she says that you make sure you take some of those seeds and you save them for later and you save them for um, the mid, mid winter and you go outside and you pick a, pick, a, uh, pick a patch wherever you want mullen to grow and you just throw them into the snow and then next year or in the year following year, um, you'll have mullen there. And so I was like, okay, grandma. And so, um, and then she said, when that stock is all dried out and that seed pod has left all its seeds out, you can take that, um, that dried out stock and you can use it for kindling. And I was like, okay. 
And I was like, what am I starting on fire? And she's like, not the house. So, <laughs> and so um, grandma taught me how to use um, the, the leaves and the flowers, um, not the leaves for tea, the leaves for, um, for smokables. Cause a lot of our, um, a lot of our um, plants that we used to use for smoke actually have, don't actually have the tobacco plant in it because they don't grow up here. Tobacco doesn't grow up here naturally. And so there's over 300 different plants um, that we use for medicine smoke. And I know tobacco's got a terrible rap right now. Um, but when we say tobacco, or when I say tobacco, I mean different herbs that we, different herbal blends that we use to smoke for medicine. Um, we used it for headache relief, for toothache relief. Um, we used it for coughs. Um, we used it for any type of, type of upper respiratory infection. Um, but we not only just smoked it, but we, all, we also used it for aromatherapy to help little ones, because we didn't let our little ones smoke, obviously. Mm -hmm. So we um, would have different blends for our babies and our children who had coughs or colds or sinus problems, like I have today. Um, it's spring, so. As much as I love plants, they just, the histamine doesn't love me. <laughs> um, and so we used to use different kinds of plants uh, for our children to like breathe in, uh, to help out with up, upper respiratory sinus, headaches, toothaches, um, to help calm them down. And a base of almost all of our smokes was mullen. And so um, some botanists, um, Western botanists like to, like to um, argue with me on that and say, no, Europeans brought that over. And I'm like, well, if it was up to you, you guys would have brought all over all the plants and there was nothing here. Um, so that's not quite accurate. Um, and then I, you know, we talk about different years and how um, different uh, cultural stories that I have been told um, can like go, obviously go back before 1492 and all, that, all those other years um, that talk about uh, when we use these different plants for different purposes. And so, um, you know, mullen was one of those that we have used for thousands and thousands of years um, because of its health benefits. Um, we used it not only for, for teas and, and, you know, all those other things and kindling, um, but we also used the root. Um, the root for uh, mullen was used um, for a pain reliever and more specifically back pain relief. And so we would use that in a tea, um, in a really strong tea that tastes absolutely terrible. Um, it's awful. It tastes like dirt. Um, but uh, <laughs> not the best one. Uh, but we would also ferment it, and we would save it for later and make it, because uh, when you ferment um, certain plants and things like that, it makes it super strong. And then you only need a couple drops to help relieve back pain and stiff back. And so it was also known as a men's medicine, because men apparently complain more <laughs> about their backs than women <laughs> in our culture. So. Um, that was known as a men's medicine. And so, but we often didn't take the, take the root, or us women didn't take the root. Um, anyway, which drives me nuts, because it's like, dude, I'm pregnant right now, and my back always hurts. Um, <laughs> I use more mullen root more than my husband. But, um, uh, so women didn't necessarily take, always take the root, um, because that was seen as more of a men's medicine. But after women would come and they would do their harvest in the mullen patch, um, men would go through and they would pick uh, roots here and there, and a root will last you quite a long time, especially if you're going to use it as a, as a tincture or a tea because you really don't need a whole lot, and that root um, kind of, it lasts forever once it dries out. Um, I have mullen roots that are, that are, that are like, you know, kind of have memories attached to them, so they're like super old hanging up in my cabinet. <laughs> and they're still good. But um, so, you know, that's a little bit about mullen is that we use it for teas, smokables, um, tonics. And um, I actually use it in quite a bit of my, my elderberry tonics because it helps out with respiratory. Um, it's a terrible tea by itself, so I don't sell it as a tea because it tastes absolutely awful. Um, so I like to mix it with different herbs and things like that. And so I'm not a big um, mullen tea drinker just because of the flavor. Um, I have a thing with flavor. I, if it doesn't taste good, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> so um, anyway, that, that uh, mullen was one of my, my grandma's favorite ones. Her other one that she used to use all the time um, was plantain. And so that one was, um, and if you know anything about plantain, is it's everywhere. 
um, it grows absolutely everywhere. And that one, uh, my grandma loved it because it was a food, it was a medicine, um, and it was a first aid. And so uh, first aid, that was one of the first plants that I learned about is that though that's the one that my uncle Neil put on my hands. Um, that's the one that he put on my bee sting. And then um, I have a scar on my lip. Um, I was swinging on the swing set that I was told not to swing on. And I decided to go as high as I could and the swing broke. And I put my front teeth through my bottom lip. And so um, before, uh, or where, where we lived, you know, back home, um, it's like at least a half hour to a decent hospital. And so as I'm like bleeding all over the place, I'm like, oh wait, 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 nobody panic. You know, as there's a hole in my lip and I'm like, look, my finger goes through. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm like, wait, there's plantain somewhere. And I grabbed some plantain and I balled it up and I stuck it in that hole um, and it quit bleeding. And then it quit bleeding so I wasn't, it wasn't all over the place. And my, you know, I finally got to the, my grandma's house and I was like, grandma, I think I needed to go to the hospital. I think I actually need stitches. And she was like, for what? And I go like this and the, my uh, plantain plug fell out of my hole. <laughs> and she was like, oh God, yeah, you do have to go. And so I had to go and get my first five stitches. Um, um, anyway, anyway, so that, you know, that was my first experience of like, hey, I can heal, I can help myself until I can get to medical. And so, um, cause it was, it went all the way through, my teeth went through and I'd stuck my finger through there. I remember sticking my pinky through there thinking, hey, cool. <laughs> my cousins, my cousin Curtis, who's four years older than me, he was like, I'm gonna get in so much trouble. And I'm just like, no, just tell him I wasn't listening. And he's like, I know, but you never listen. And I was like, I know, that's why it's a good story. Cause it's, it's, not, a, it's not a lie. <laughs> And so, um, you know, he did get in trouble because he was supposed to be watching us, but I never, I never listened. So, um, you know, thinking about that was my first use of it, of rescuing myself with plantain. And I was probably seven, eight, because I had missing teeth already. So I was like, that's, you know, starting to lose my, my baby teeth. And I just had just my front teeth that went through my lip. So I blamed it on, you know, the tooth fairy not coming soon enough. Because if the tooth fairy would have came and take my front teeth, then I wouldn't ever put my teeth through, through my front lip. So <laughs> I blame that on the tooth fairy. And the nurse was just like, mm-hmm, as she's stitching me up. I was like, yeah. It's like, yeah, I blame the tooth fairy. Um, anyway, <laughs> and so uh, plantain was one that, you know, I rescued myself with. And then um, we were, another farm story is that we were playing, we had just built, um, we had stolen some, hammer and nails and we just built ourselves this tree house which now that I'm 39 looking back on it we all should have died um because it was pretty far it was like 40 50 feet up in the air we decided to build our tree house in this wonky little tree and um my cousin Curtis had fallen out of the tree and he had fallen out and he had fallen out with this giant screwdriver flathead screwdriver and he within his hand and he had fallen 40, 50 feet and landed on his arm and the screwdriver was just right here when he landed. And so incredibly lucky, incredibly lucky that um, he didn't, you know, impale himself, but he had a huge cut in his shirt and um, the screwdriver had actually cut him um, not too deep to need stitches, but it was a pretty big cut and we're like, oh my God, we're going to get in so much trouble. And uh, never mind that he broke his shoulder and his arm. We were worried about the cut in his t-shirt. Um, you know, he he wasn't too worried about his shoulder. He's like, I don't know why my arm's just hanging there, but my mom's gonna freak when she sees my brand new t-shirt. And so I'm like, I know, I know, I know. So I went and I grabbed some plantain and I packed it in there. And then for his um, for mending his shirt, um, if you've ever picked plantain and you pick it, and you know that those there's those little strings inside the leaf. Well, I, used, I pulled those out of the plant, um, and then I went to one of the trees that had us, um, those spikes on it. I can't remember the name of the tree. And I used that as a needle, and I sewed up his shirt. And then we took off to the house, and then we went to the hospital. <laughs> and nobody got in trouble for the shirt because nobody knew that I had stitched up the shirt <laughs> with plantain until she washed it and the, it fell apart. But um, then we got in trouble because um, it was a brand new t-shirt. Um, and so, and I told my uncle Neil about what I did with the t-shirt after we got in trouble. 
Um, and he was like, oh, that's really cool. And then he showed me this book um, from the uh, from after the Civil War, where soldiers were writing about using plantain for stitches, for sutures, and I was like, "Wow, I didn't know that." And he was, and he was like, "What gave you that idea?" I was like, "Well, I was pulling it out of the ground, and I saw these strings, and they were pretty strong, so I just thought I would use it as a, as a string to to stitch up the shirt." And he was like, "That's pretty good." I was like, "That's cool." <laughs> He's like, "Am I?" And I was like, "Am I ungrounded?" He's like, "No." So, <laughs> like, okay. He's like, not till Curtis's cast comes off. And I was like, dang. Um, so, and when we were grounded, we were grounded from the horses. And that was my biggest thing. Um, how I learned how to ride a horse is that when I was four or five years old, my uncle threw me bareback on a horse, full gorn, full grown quarter horse, um, and just slapped the, the butt of the horse and took off and said, all right, let me know if you need any help. And I'm like running down, you know, hanging on for dear life. This little tiny toddler that's like this big. Um, and so that was our punishment when we got in big trouble. It was grounded from the horses, and that was, um, you know, a big part of our summer was riding horses, catching and riding horses. And then, uh, so I was pretty sad. But he was pretty proud of me that I stitched up the shirt with plantain. Um, and then he gave me that book, and that book was pretty cool because it was it was printed right after the Civil War era, and a lot of the soldiers had gathered all these stories. Uh, from being in, on the battlefield. And uh, a lot of what my great-grandma Eva, from the other side of my family, had told me was written in that book that um, the soldiers had learned from other indigenous tribes, and they just wrote it down. And so the, the plantain and the sutures um, is always a story that picks, you know, sticks out to me. That book is super old and probably should be in a museum, but um, <laughs> I still have it. And um, he, uh, there's so many stories in there because there's not just mullen and plantain. Um, there's uh, what we call pigweed over here or wild amaranth. And uh, that's another one that my grandma uses and then um, that was in that book as well. And that's another one that we, that, you know, we have dubbed today as, as a noxious weed because you can't kill it apparently. But it's actually um, a superfood of superfoods. And so, yes ma'am. Um, no, I don't, because I'm in the process of moving buildings, and I wasn't able to put anything on my Google Drive, so, <laughs> um, I do, so if you look up wild amaranth, and you'll see it, it grows everywhere, amaranth, so I can't spell off the top of my head, there you go, she's got it, yep, pigweed, another common name for it is pigweed. And so that one is a uh, one that my grandma used to use, and that was one that we would go harvest because there's a seed stock at the top of it, and we would use that one. Um, that one's also known as wild quinoa, and so um, we would use that and save that, and we would use that in soups and stews as a rice replacement because you know, um, over here in the Midwest and South Dakota, um, my great grandparents didn't have access to wild rice, and so they used the wild quinoa or pigweed or wild amaranth, um, and they would use that as their grain in soups and stews. Um, and it actually has a pretty singing high vitamin content, um, has a protein level too, but it's not just the seed stock, the whole plant is edible. So you can eat the leaves, you can eat the stock, um, you can eat the seeds. And then you can also eat the root. It doesn't taste that great. Um, but you can eat the root. And so um, my grandma would use that whole plant, um, and she would harvest it, and she would dry it out, and she would save it for soups and stews. Um, and she would use it for in the winter, um, because that's usually when you know, times were hardest to find nutrition, uh, nutritional value, uh, or plants that had a high nutritional value. Um, there's tree bark soup, but it doesn't taste or sound great because um, <laughs> there's certain trees that you can eat the bark of or make it into a soup and it has a really high protein content um, as well as vitamins and minerals but she would say that's you know that's a last resort that we would go out and harvest the tree bark for soup because um, it tastes awful it tastes like you're eating wood um, and so she said that um, wild amaranth or pigweed would be the one that she would harvest throughout the year and then um, I was like, oh, okay, that's what that plant is. Because if you went in her pantry, her whole half of her pantry was just filled with this, you know, 
hanging plants of, of pigweed, and that's the one that she used the most for food. Um, it has medicinal qualities to it too, but plantain is significantly stronger as far as medicinal values, and um, she said that that one um, was more like for food. And so a long time ago, we would save those seeds, we would save the plant, and that's um, a majority of the, what we would eat for throughout the winter, along with our, our dried buffalo and things like that. And so um, we use that one quite a bit. And I have one minute left. Um, I have to pay attention to the time because I have to pick up my kids after school and my kale. <laughs> so, um, and so those are the, the three uh, main plants that uh, my grandma, my great grandma Eva taught me about. And so she said that when um, in the springtime um, or throughout the growing season, you would start harvesting all the different, uh, you would start harvesting the pigweed. And she says, you could harvest the heck out of that because that one just grows back all the time. And it's true because that's one of the ones that farmers fight most of the time, along with mullein, um, but, uh, which is super funny. Um, my uncle Neil, he was like, yeah, that one makes really good, you know, makes really good uh, rice. And I was like, uncle Neil, because he had a heart attack probably like 10 years ago. So he had to change his diet. And so um, he, uh, he was like, okay, so how I'm changing my diet. What do I need to get rid of? Well, I was like, well, first you got to get rid of all them Snicker bars in your Jeep. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then I was like, you need to get rid of all your pasta. And he was like, okay, well, what am I going to eat? Can I just eat the pigweed? And I was like, yeah, you can eat the pigweed. And, he, and I was like, did you know that they sell this stuff in the store and they call it quinoa and it's really expensive? And he was like, I didn't know that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, save yourself thousands of dollars and just go harvest it. And he was like, all right, I will. So he still eats quinoa. Um, he still goes out and harvests it and he's super excited um, because, uh, you know, obviously it's uh, springtime and he gets to get his quinoa um, storage supplies back. But that's a huge one that he eats just about every single day. And he makes soups and stews and he makes um, anything that you would make quinoa or rice with. That's what he does. And so um, he just goes out and he harvests it and he doesn't spray anywhere in his farm. And so it just takes over whole fields. Um, a nettle is a nettle, uh, stinging nettle is another one that he just doesn't spray and he just lets it grow um, because we use that one for tea. Um, it's also known as another superfood of superfoods. Um, and the whole plant is usable, which sounds terrible because it's, you know, the name is kind of intimidating, stinging nettle. Um, it does. <laughs> it does. It's pretty awful to harvest. Um, but I have a rheumatoid arthritis in my hand, so it feels pretty good. Um, so I'm the one that gets stuck harvesting it all the time um, because the rest of my, my employees and my husband are like, no, I'm not touching that. So um, I'll go out and harvest it. But there is a magic way of, you know, the, so the plant is like this and the needles stick out this way. But if you grab behind and pull, um, pull the stock, you won't get stung. And then as soon as you run it through warm or hot water, um, all the needles will not necessarily fall off, but the chemical inside them will drop. And so then you won't get stung anymore. And so we use that one for soups and stews and teas. Um, we use it in tonics. Um, nettle is pretty stinking versatile. And if you've ever eaten like um, greens or spinach, nettle is way better than that. Um, uh, we use, uh, we, we actually had um, early nettle um, last night for dinner. Um, and my kids love it because, you know, butter, salt, and pepper is like the best stuff ever. And then they're getting packed full of vitamins and minerals um, and everything that they might be lacking from the winter diet. Um, and then they just had McDonald's the day before, so. <laughs> they suckered me. Um, and uh, anyway, so nettle is, an, is another one um, that we use in salves, we use in soaps, we use in in tinctures, we use in tonics, um, we use it as an edible. Um, and when we make nettle, um, whether it's just as a green or we're adding it to soups and stews, um, it definitely changes the flavor and it's actually super good. And so um, I know that was a lot of information really quick. Do you, what questions do we have? <laughs> um, we did mullein, plantain, Amaranth, nettle, fifth, um, dandelion. So everyone knows what dandelions are, right? So that one is my grandma Eva's fifth favorite plant. Um, 
because not only does it dye your face pretty colors when you're a little kid, um, <laughs> but we used to use it as a natural dye. Um, we also used to use it in salads, soups, and stews. Um, the, head, the heads of the flowers, you can make a really good tea out of it using the heads of the flowers. Um, careful, it will dye your mouth. Um, and then you can also use uh, the, the stem and the leaves of the plant for salads, soups, and stews. Um, it has a really high vitamin C content. That's why it's bright yellow. Um, it has, uh, it's one of the first foods in spring that are for, that, you know, that are meant for pollinators, but it's actually, you can make a dandelion tea with it. You can make dandelion honey with it. Um, you can uh, make dandelion syrups with it. I guess there's, I'm sober, but I guess you can make wine with it. Um, <laughs> and then the dandelion root, um, she would use as like a parsnip. You guys all know what parsnips are. Okay. Uh, the younger generations, they're like, what's that? Um, what's a parsnip? So it's a root vegetable. And so we used to use that as a, as a um, parsnip. And then my mom takes the root, she dries it out, and then she use it, uses it as coffee because it has a mocha flavor coffee with it. And then um, dandelion is actually really good for helping heal the skin. So if you get the um, contact dermatitis type, uh, type issues or um, what we call, um, oh, what's it called? I can't remember the, the medical name for it, but you get bumps on the back of your arm from um, like different nutritional uh, deficiencies and things like that. Or if you have like inflammation, um, my, 12 year, thir oh, yeah, she's 13 now. My 13 year old stepdaughter, um, she calls it brown skin people because she's got really dark, uh, really dark uh, skin. And she uh, gets those bumps every summer just from the sun. And so she uses, uh, I taught her how to make dandelion salve and that is what clears up the, her skin really well. Um, and so we use that one for more like uh, gentle skin healing ones, not necessarily first aid. Um, because it's not that great of a salve, but it's more of a like smooth your skin out, give your skin some collagen um, type salve for dandelions. And so dandelion would be a food, a medicine, um, and then a, a natural dye. And so, I can't remember. Aha, yes. So these are porcupine quills, the colors all the way around. And the yellow in them is where we used to get uh, is what we would, uh, the dandelions is what we used to use to get the yellow color in all of our, everything that we would dye. Um, we would, because of the, you know, not only does it come off on your face really well, but when you soak it in with some brain matter and whatever you want to um, dye, permanently dye yellow, it'll come off really, really well. And so um, dandelion tea is what is my nine-year-old's favorite tea right now. And so she's stoked because she's waiting for the dandelions to pop in Mankato because they haven't popped yet. Um, and so she's stoked for that. And then my 10-year-old um, makes dandelion fritters. So she takes the heads of the dandelions, dips them in some flour, um, egg mix, salt and pepper, and then she fries them up. And those are super good. Um, and that is super good for her because she has multiple vitamin deficiencies. And so vitamin C, that's pretty cool for her to um, get into. The nine-year-old loves it for the tea, um, also helps out with her health issues because she has vitamin deficiencies as well. They're just born without immune systems. And so um, they use those ones. And obviously it's pretty easy to identify dandelions. You just gotta make sure that you don't harvest um, where anybody sprays and you're 100% sure you know what you're harvesting. Um, and then you're 60 miles away from where cars um, are frequently going, um, 60 feet away from a roadside or motor vehicles. Um, just because of the, the exhaust, um, the plants breathe those in, and then now that's a part of the plant. And so um, just make sure you know where you're harvesting, that they don't spray, that you're 100% sure you know what you're harvesting, and then away from roadsides or spray. So those are... Mm -hmm. Talk to the farmer wherever you're at. Um, there are certain public land areas that are kind of all littered throughout uh, Minnesota or in the Midwest where you are allowed to harvest. 
um, especially um, ones that the DNR has dubbed as noxious weeds. So um, they're like, yes, come get them. Otherwise, there's um, the prairie, prairie, prairie enthusiasts. They're a group that are like kind of all over the Midwest. Um, they they ask that people come harvest some of these. <laughs> so they're more focused on the prairie flowers, not necessarily all the different parts of, of a prairie. And so um, they would they 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 have us come harvest their mullein and their pigweed and stuff like that. We don't use pigweed in um, Lakota made products. We use that mainly for food. But um, yeah, just being aware um, and knowing where, whose land you're on, um, where when's the last time that they sprayed? Because it can be depends upon the spray. Um, they can have like a half life of like seven years. So you have to be kind of be aware. Um, of where, who sprayed, who owned the land, you know, the last seven years ago, when was the last time that they sprayed? Because um, that could still be in the land and in the plants. So being careful with that. Yes, sir? I got a question to ask you. Do you ever run into any cleared grass or buffalo's grass in your ass? Yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. Yep, that one's uh, pretty common, over, especially over in South Dakota. So. Yes, ma'am. The nettles, do you eat that raw or do you steam it? Or you can you steam it. You can uh, fry it. We prefer to saute it in butter, salt, and pepper. You can throw it in soups and stews. Um, you can have it dried, um, especially, and you can sprinkle it into, you know, after it's dried, you can sprinkle it into just about any dish you want and still have the nutritional value. That's what we do with my, um, with my kids. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, it's just parsley, honey. You're fine. Um, <laughs> And so we just, uh, you know, we keep it year round, keep it in a big jar, and we just randomly sprinkle it in food to help keep um, their vitamin C and their vitamins, con you know, vitamin and nutritional value uh, up throughout the winter. And so we just sprinkle it in just about everything that we make from eggs to not cereal. But um, lasagna was a la was the last one. Um, but yeah, we. It's coming up now. It is. is the, I suppose when it's younger, it's ten more tender. When it's younger about this or this high and under it is super packed full of new it's like super nutrient dense that's when you want it when they call it purple nettle too so if you can find the purple nettle that's like the best of the best but yep the younger the plant the better you can harvest nettle um, up until it blooms and then the whole plant is focused on making those blooms for seeds so um, up until it blooms is is the time and then they do obviously they keep growing throughout the year so you cut them down they come back um, that's what our, we do with our nettle patches is we mow it down, dry it, hang it. Hangs really well in bundles. Um, st stores in your kitchen um, pretty well. You just got to make sure that um, you let them uh, hang dry outside for a couple days because all the wonderful bugs that live on there, um, you don't want those in your house. <laughs> so just hang them, hang them outside for a couple days um, and then bring them inside and they'll, they'll dry really well. And dandelions, um, you can... You can make fresh salads with those. Um, you can, you know, make fritters out of them. You can uh, make teas with them. And then the root and the, the plant itself dries out really well. Um, and then to preserve, preserve those, you can keep those in jars um, because they do dry really well. Mullen dries really, really, really well. Um, you can just lay those out on screens or on a table. Hopefully the wind doesn't come and get them um, and let them sit outside in the sun for a couple days and they dry out really well. Um, the stock, we really don't really use the stock. Um, you can use it for food. Um, it's kind of one of those doesn't taste that great type food, so you can, but if you really want to, you can use the stock of a mullein um, for like a celery, celery replacer, um, but it's not that great at tasting. Um, but yeah, you can use the mullein root, dries out really well, the whole plant dries out really well. Yes, ma'am. Um, the plant, it, it, does that dry well? Yes. Well, and does, um, does it still have the same properties when it's dry? So, like, it'll stop bleeding even in the winter? Yep. So, it'll help stop bleeding in the winter. And you can use it as um, a food, a medicine, um, and a first aid. So, if you want to use it, um, it does, like, you should harvest when you're after the plantain, you're looking for the newer leaves of the plant. 
So the bigger, older leaves you're not necessarily after, but the newer leaves of the plant. And you're just gonna take a couple from each plant. You're not gonna like completely deplete the plant. Um, and then the seed stalks of the plantain are like green beans. You can eat them like green beans. They taste really good, um, especially fresh. My kids go out and snap those off all the time and eat them as snacks, especially when we're hiking. So you can take that plant and you're only after the newer leaves of the, the plantain, not the, not the bigger, older ones because they, they can get pretty big. Um, the leaves can get pretty big, but you're only after the newer ones, for, for especially for, for first aid. If you're after it for just food, you can harvest the whole, um, um, the whole plant. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So, let me see. Me and my uncle were just texting about it, so let me see if it's... I don't know if it's still in print. I just know I have a super old, crusty copy of it. It might be. Um... That's not the right one. I don't even know who authored it. I think it's just a compilation of stories. And I just cracked my phone screen this morning, so it's not quite working right. In my 20 years of having a cell phone, today was the first day I ever cracked the screen. I was so so annoyed. <laughs> um, it's not letting me open the, the chat chat box. So I, I don't know the name of it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the last time that my cousin, um, she just Googled um, Civil War era plant book. And I think she found quite a few different versions of it. But it's, yeah, it's a Civil, Civil War era plant book is what she did. I just Googled it and she found a couple different copies, a couple different versions. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. So do you have these salves and ointments and things available in your store? I do have plantain salve for sure. Mullen I use in tonics and different, um, different things and then in tinctures as well. Um, plantains and just about everything that I do. Nettles and quite a few stuff. Um, that I use at the store. So the uh, store's not open yet because we're moving. Like this today's day three. Um, so I was supposed to bring product today, but I couldn't find it because someone mislabeled some totes. So, um. <laughs> yes, ma'am. New store location is 606 North Riverfront. Yep. It's across the street from Dork Den and the Nicolette Bike Company. Yep. Yep, Old Town. Still a safe place, just a block and a half up. So, yeah. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you guys for listening. <laughs>